Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Miller, and welcome to the second lecture on Jain asceticism. Here we're going to talk about the six obligatory actions, carefully following Paul Dundas's book, The Jains, pages 169 through 186. We already talked about Jain asceticism in the prior lecture. We introduced some of the core vows and practices. Here we're going to look at some of the ritual praxis that begins with the Jain ascetic, but then also will, as we see, go into Jain lay life as well in future lectures. Here we'll focus on how the six obligatory actions developed within the ascetic community as foundation for regular ritual practice. The topics that we'll look at are first the six obligatory actions themselves. We'll look at them in detail. We'll look at the way that ascetics interact with the laity, the lay people, as we make a transition into discussing lay people, the, you know, the householders like you and I in future lectures. We'll look at the institution of giving or dana, charity that supports the ascetic community so they can practice the six obligatory actions. And we'll look at the fast to death, which is known as salekana or samkara. This is often confused with suicide, but it is not suicide as we shall see. It is really the most honorable way to let one's life go as a Jain, especially as an ascetic. And finally, we'll look at the role of the Acharya, the great teacher within the Jain tradition. Just to begin with an overview, as we always do, Jainism, as Paul Dundas notes, took longer than Buddhism to develop an ascetic ritual and liturgy. Within the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, these ritual and liturgical practices, these daily rituals, such as the one that you see in the right in the illustration, were a normal thing within Hinduism and also in Buddhism. Jainism, however, took longer to develop these practices, but eventually did following Hinduism and Buddhism. Before ritual, as Dundas points out, Jain, the Jain tradition was primarily concerned with the adjustment of behavior based on the plurality of life, meaning rather than performing rituals on a daily basis, what was seen as primarily important was how one perfected nonviolence based on the fact that there were many forms of life and none of those forms of life wanted to experience pain. Ritual, as you will recall, is actually something that the Jain tradition initially rejected because it rejected the Vedic ritual sacrifice of the Hindus. But eventually, to kind of keep up with the times, as all religions do, the Jains developed their own ritual praxis, one that would allow Jains to practice ritual without having to convert to Hinduism or Buddhism. And ritual remains a powerful part of practice in most traditions all the way into the present, though not all, as we'll see in future lectures. There was a pre-sectarian ritual as Dundas points out, and you see in bullet point number three, of six obligatory actions, one of the main topics of this lecture. This eventually emerges, right, used, and it was used by lay and ascetics alike eventually, right? It was pre-sectarian, meaning everyone could practice this, these six obligatory actions before all the sects broke out. So this was something that was core and important for all Jains and still is for most today. We'll go through each of the six obligatory actions here to describe what they are. The first is equanimity, samayaka. In the early text, equanimity simply meant that one had correct conduct in mind, body, and speech. This is not unlike the three guptis that we saw, the three protections that the ascetics have to take, right? They have to be careful what they think, be careful what they do, and be careful what they say. All must be grounded ultimately in an ethic of nonviolence. And so the practice or obligatory action of equanimity, samayaka, implied merely the correct conduct in mind, body, and speech. As time went on, however, equanimity or samayaka developed into a quasi meditative practice or state, right? Here you would remain in a motionless state or position for 48 minutes, such as you see the monk here to the right in this image. In this meditative state, one would burn karma essentially, right? And as you see in bullet point number four, suppress their passions and their negative mental traits. So all the things that you wanna do, all the things that you wanna enact, all the things you want to think, you have to suppress all of those things and sit quietly for 48 minutes. And imagine what that would be like to sit for 48 minutes straight. Some people do it all the time, regular meditators. But as anyone who's tried meditation will tell you, 
it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. And so this is a spiritual practice to produce equanimity where the polarities of life do not pull you in all different directions and you gain a certain amount of concentration and mental control over yourself. In addition to that, one is also expected to generate goodwill toward all creatures in the practice of Samayaka. So not only are you suppressing all your negative traits and passions, but you're doing so in the, with the intention of creating goodwill toward all of creation. The second and third are praise to the Ford makers, which is giving devotion or bhakti, as the Sanskrit word means devotion, to Mahavira, for example, or the Tirthankaras. So you're giving praise to the Ford makers, those who set the example of how to be liberated, who brought the Jain teachings to this world, these universal teachings of nonviolence and so on. Every day, you have to give some praise to the Ford makers, not because you expect anything in return, but because you take great inspiration from them. And in doing so, you yourself become like them. Third, homage to the teacher, Vandana. In this case, you have to thank, or you thank your teacher, but request forgiveness from your teacher for transgressions, for things you've done. If you've disobeyed or you haven't lived up to the Jain path as well as your teacher would expect you to. Request forgiveness and also at the same time, inquire regarding your teacher's welfare. Check in with your teacher. How is your teacher doing? Does your teacher need something? Your teacher does so much for you. Take care of your teacher. So praise to the form makers and homage to the teacher. Here I'm going to show you a brief video of praise to the Ford makers, Bhakti, a hymn of praise to Mahavira. saying Om Jai Jai Mahavir, right? Giving great devotion to the Tirthankara Mahavir for inspiration to live a life not unlike his, nonviolent and free from passions and free from karma. So that's done, supposed to be done every day as one of the six obligatory actions. The fourth thing is called repentance, pratikramana, or quote unquote, going back, could mean going back, and maybe you're returning to correct behavior. You're taking time out each day to reflect on how you have made transgressions in against the institutions and the vows of the Jain tradition, especially nonviolence, asking for forgiveness, but then also going back, returning back to that, that correct behavior that is in line with the Jain tradition, right? So this is like a daily ritual action. Imagine if you do this every single day, what that would do for you, right? It's supposed to be performed with your teacher twice per day, and then every two weeks, monthly and annually on a grand scale. One of the examples of this is during the festival of Paryushan every year in August or September, when the Jains ask for forgiveness from one another and reflect on their past behaviors and make right and try to move forward with a better intention for how they will live the Jain life going forward. This might be, as Dundas points out, preceded by a confession. Look, these are the things I did. It's not like unlike in the Catholic tradition, right? These are the things I did, the transgressions, and this is how then I intend to be asked for forgiveness for them and then to move forward in life so I will not commit these things again. I'll show you a quick video of one instance, a short instance, of how Pratikramana might be performed by people. And this is an instance of asking for forgiveness for not performing Samayaka, the first of the six obligatory actions, correctly. 
Samaik Vrat Ke Atichar Transgressions of the Vow of Equanimity I may not have practiced equanimity. I may not have properly understood the true nature of Samayak. I may not have maintained the spiritual harmony of body, mind and speech. I may not have detached myself of worldly affairs. I may not have performed Samayak with enthusiasm. I may not have performed Samayak according to the laid down formalities. If I have committed any of the above sins, I pray that they be dissolved. Michami Dukram. Okay, so you can see how in one instance, this is a ritual practice of confessing what's been done and then making and then setting an intention to do it properly going forward. The fifth and sixth of the six obligatory actions are abandonment of the body and abandonment in general. These are really focused on giving up one's attachment to the mind body and all the attachments that come with the mind body, right? Because in Jain tradition, you're trying to overcome those things, overcome those passions, overcome the mind and the body to set the soul free. The first of those, number five, abandonment of the body, is also known as kaya utsarga, which comes from kaya, body, and utsarga, to transcend or go beyond or rise above the body. The most famous, or perhaps one of the most famous examples of Kayot Sarga is the statue of Bahubali found in various parts of India, especially in Shravana Belgola, as we saw in a previous lecture, that is every 12 years anointed for the equanimity that it represents and the liberation that it represents and the potential for human liberation that it presents. As you'll recall, Bahubali, after defeating his half-brother Bharata, went out into the forest feeling bad, thinking, this is not right. I don't like being a king because you have to commit violence. He went to repent in the forest for his violence against his brother, even though it was in self-defense. He stood still for a year, some say, most say. And while standing still for a year, the anthills grew around the bottom of his feet and the vines and the creepers crawled around his body, as you see in the image here. And as a result of not moving, of totally controlling his mind and body and passions, of any desire to do anything, he was liberated in this upright position. The upright position itself is referred to as kayot sarga, abandonment of the body. The sixth obligatory action again is abandonment, pratyakhyana, which is a commitment to abstain from transgressions, right? So a commitment back to pratikramana number four, I will not do this again, even though I did it this time, even though I didn't do samayak right this time, going forward, I will not do it incorrectly anymore. I will do it correctly from now on. Okay, so it's a commitment to stay on the Jain path very carefully by abstaining from any transgressions and to not eat certain substances. Okay, so this could be a variety of things, but as you'll recall, one of the practices of the ascetics is to refrain from eating spiced or flavored food. So you're only eating food to sustain your body, but you're not doing it for pleasure. So this would be perhaps one way to express abandonment, one of the six and final obligatory actions. <clears throat> the next topic I would like to cover with you is the ascetic interaction with the laity. Because in the next two lectures, we're gonna look at Jain lay people, how they're different from the ascetics, but also how they're related to the ascetics, how they support the ascetics. In the earliest texts, as Dundas points out, there is no relationship between the lay and the ascetic person. Instead, the ascetics are kind of out on their own on the fringes of society, isolated, maybe together as ascetics, but they're not working closely with the lay community for substantial support as they will later in the classical, medieval, and contemporary period. However, as time went on, the four month monsoon period in India, referred to sometimes as Chaturmas, the four months during which there is the monsoon, a retreat period arose, which became a key time to for the ascetics to create a relationship with the laity. Why was that? Well, in order to find shelter and to find lodging during the monsoon, when the rain was pouring down, to be safe from the elements, the monks and nuns, the ascetics of the Jain tradition, would find lodging and find caretaking with lay people in temporary lodging houses or in the temples, in Jain temples, places like that. There they would be fed, there they would be housed, there they would have their basic needs taken care of, medicine and so forth. But in exchange, they would give teachings to the lay people, they would study, 
and they would take the time to reinforce their Jain learning, right? And share it with the lay people as well. So there was an exchange here and it begins with this four month monsoon retreat and then eventually develops into a really a full-time thing where as you see in the third bullet point, the laity will even travel with ascetics and wait on their needs no matter where they go. So if the ascetics travel, lay people will go with them. If they want, the, lay, the ascetics can stay in the lodging for longer periods of time. And generally speaking, the ascetics today, the monks and the nuns, tend to stay in lodging. The, I, I, the idea of isolation today, of social isolation away from the temples and lodging is really, as Dundas pointed out before, an ideal. It's not something that's usually carried out by the ascetics. So we can see that the laity and the ascetics develop a relationship of mutual reciprocity, of synergy, where one supports the other. The ascetics support the laity with spiritual teachings of the Jain tradition. And they, in exchange for that, the lay people feed them, house them, give them the basic things that they need to continue to pursue their own liberation. This gives rise to an institution known as dana. Dana is used in Sanskrit, not just in the Jain tradition, but in other traditions to connote something like donation or charity, philanthropy, giving, especially religious and spiritual giving. It's a key practice, as Dundas points out, that binds the lay people and the ascetics together. They give something like food, lodging, or medicine, they as in the lay people, things that ascetics can't buy or prepare because they're not allowed to. And in exchange, the lay person, as you see in the last bullet point, receives some sort of good karmic merit, punya karma, right? They also receive Jain teachings from the ascetics who share with them Jain philosophy. So there's a exchange here, right? There's again, teaching and, and ca good karma. And in exchange, the ascetics receive the basic things they need to keep going on the spiritual path. As Dundas points out, the Shvetambara will seek food twice a day in this, in the, that's the most common form of dana, right? Food, giving food, alms. The Shvetambara nuns and monks will seek food twice a day from the lay people, so they eat two meals per day, which by today's standards is still not that much, right? And the Digambra will seek food only one time per day, and they do it only with their hands. Whereas, if you may recall from a lecture before, the Shvetambaras have bowls, as you can see here in the video to the right that I'm about to show you. The Shvetambaras have receptacles, so they can take a little bit of extra food and so on and store a little bit of food for the day. The Digambaras eat only one time a day and with their hands, right? So that's a pretty extreme practice. And as we recall, the Digambaras are the most ascetic of the ascetics. And that's just how it is, okay? So I'm gonna show you a video now of a Shvetambara monk who is receiving alms from a lay person. And so you'll see a little bit of what that's like. It's a, it's a little bit of a ritual practice in and of itself. You'll see the care that the lay person takes in listening to the junior monk as he gives this food over to the teacher, the higher teacher, the elder, and really does so with great love and care.
can see from this video, it's the generosity of the lay institution, of the lay men and women that allows these monks to live a very simple and basic life with basic food, basic clothing, basic shelter to pursue liberation, perhaps not in this lifetime, but maybe in a future lifetime. And in exchange, these lay householders like you and I receive karmic merit with the hope of perhaps in a future life somewhere way down the line being reborn into a situation where they too may be able to go on this ascetic path and journey. Now, I've mentioned this before, within the Jain tradition, there is a practice of fasting unto death, right? So if food is a preoccupation of the institution of dana, of giving to support monks and nuns on their path so that they can have the basic food that they need to survive to practice their, their Jain ascetic practices, the fast unto death is a, the stopping of that, okay? It's, it's the eradication of the desire even to eat or even to drink and finally to breathe. So salekana can literally mean scoured out. You're literally scouring out your body of all of its karma, right? Because you're giving up all even the basic human desires and needs, basic human needs, right? It's also called samtara, which can mean deathbed. And so what I really want to emphasize, as Dundas does and others have, is that from a Jain perspective, this is not death or it is not suicide. It is, it is the most honorable way to die, right? Because you are giving up all of your desires, you are relinquishing any violence that you need to have inflicted on the world on your behalf to even produce food for you or even to breathe in microorganisms in order to burn away your karma. Okay, so it's often understood within this context that the person undertaking this fast unto death, as they give up food, as they give up water, and as they finally give up their breath, that this is done with intention and that the giving up and the turning over of the breath is an intentional thing. So you're not necessarily even dying per se in a passive sense, you're dying in a very active sense and that you are in charge, you are relinquishing that final thing that you need to live, which is the breath, okay? And this is performed in a full ritual context, as we will see. We will also see that you can't just do this because you want to do this because you want to die or you're tired of life or you want to achieve liberation, right? Those would all be attachments. If you wanted to just do this to die, right? You have to obtain monastic permission from a higher authority. And importantly, you must already be terminally ill and unable to perform the six obligatory actions. So this is for people who are reaching the end of life, who rather than prolonging life unnecessarily and continuing to take from the world and inflict, violence on the world to keep themselves alive for a little bit longer. They voluntarily take a vow of Salekana or Samtara to allow themselves willfully and intentionally to give up those things, food, water, and finally the breath. By the 12th century, as Dundas points out, lay people also start to perform this and still will perform this to this day. Although it is mainly a practice reserved for the ascetics, it is not uncommon also for a lay person to undertake the practice of Samtara or Salekana. I'm gonna show you a brief video from National Geographic that documents this process of Salekana, of a nun who undertook the process. And you can see that the nun is surrounded by people supporting her, not cheering her on, but essentially you know, supporting her in a very uplifting way, right? They're all around her, they're chanting mantras, they're singing songs, they're clapping. They're there for her in full moral support as she makes this transition and relinquishes the breath. I will have to warn you, for those of you who may be sensitive, there is going to be someone who dies in this video. She's going to die very peacefully and she's going to be dying with support. But I want us to just be aware that as I play this, that that is something that you're going to see here in this video. According to Jain religion, if anyone has taken this kind of initiation, we all like to participate in that ritual, even if it's not our mother. We feel that this is the greatest blessing we can receive in our lives. Mataji is experiencing an almost celebrity-like status. People are coming from all across the country to pay their respects to her and witness her endure this uh, honorable rite of passage in the Jain faith. You're a living saint for the period of time in which you are, you are practicing the vow. Five p.m. Death closes in once more. 
followers chant the names of gods. But again, Mataji survives. Thirty minutes after midnight, her body goes into crisis again. At 6 a.m., Mataji breathes her last. So as we can see in this particular tradition, in the Jain tradition, death is something not to be scared of, per se. There's certainly a, uh, an amount of suffering that's going to go into this, definitely, as there is with most any death. But it is celebrated as a moment of, of saintliness, so in a, in a celebration of, of the transition that this person is going to make, that this soul, the jiva, is going to make. And so in a world that we live in that is so afraid to confront death, be around death, or be around suffering that is leading to death, we can really take inspiration from the way that this Jain tradition actually inverts the notions of death as something to be avoided. Rather, it is something to be celebrated and celebrated ritually and carefully and respectfully. So I hope that this has been inspiring for you to see this and that uh, you'll understand that when you hear the word salekana or santara used in the future, it's referring to this ritual death. It's referring to the relinquishment of one's karma with the goal of something higher, right? Giving up any need to inflict any more violence or take anything else from the world. And having gone through that, I will end here with a brief description of the role of the Acharya, the great teacher of Jainism, of the Jain tradition. So there are many Acharyas in Jainism, right? These are spiritual preceptors of the highest rank. You might think of them as analogous to something like the Pope, although there isn't, although there isn't one central Acharya in the Jain tradition, and there can be male and female Acharyas, such as Acharya Chandanaji, who you see here pictured on the right. Acharya Chandanaji has a great organization, Viryatan, and she gives a lot, a lot, a lot back to the community philanthropically as an ascetic. This is an interesting development in the Jain tradition. An Valali has written about the, her before in our book, Beacons of Dharma, if you're interested in learning more about uh, Acharya Chandanaji. There's a chapter about her which lays out the idea that ascetics no longer have to be fully withdrawn from the world socially. Because as we saw in the past, as Jainism began, ascetics were at the margins of society. They were socially isolated. They didn't have a care or concern for the world. But Acharya Chandanaji is really interesting in the fact that she's reinterpreting the ascetic path and what it means to be an ascetic. She's in full service of humanity, providing medical services and education and other things to the community in Bihar and North India, because she sees this area, which has a lot of poverty, as an important place to revive. It was Mahavira's birthplace, right? Where Mahavira roamed and gave his original teachings. Acharya Chandanaji has taken the ascetic path, something that used to be a removal from the world, removal of oneself from the world. And she's also inverted the meaning of that, right? So here she is, an ascetic who's organized an incredible organization of philanthropy to give back to the local people in North India. 
According to the text, the Cheta Sutras, as you see in the second bullet point here, the minimum requirements to be an Acharya, like Acharya Chandanaji, are to have one clean moral conduct. Okay, so we can see why that would be important. If you're going to be a leader of an ascetic practice, such as the Jain tradition, you should have yourself clean moral conduct. You should be a good person trying to perfect nonviolence. And in Acharya Chandanaji's case, Chandanaji's case, you're actually giving back. You're doing something proactive, right? You have to have spent eight years as a monk, or in this case, a nun, right? But in the Cheta Sutras, as a monk. And you have to have full familiarity with the third and fourth Anga of the Jain tradition. As you recall, there were 12 primary Angas or limbs of texts or scriptures within the Jain canon. And in order to become an Acharya, you have to have full familiarity all the way up with the third and fourth of those limbs. That way you'll be able to teach others. You'll be able to run the run your institution or your group of, of ascetics and lay people according to those scriptures and teachings, right? So you have to have theological training essentially. Now the Acharya position fell out of favor for quite a long time as Dundas points out, but it was recently revived in the 19th and 20th century, for example, from the work of Acharya Shanti Sagara, who was a Digambara, right? Uh, the title was given during this time of revival for, for charisma and for the ascetic practices of the Acharya, right? So with people like Acharya Shanti Sagara and others such as Acharya Chandanaji, one gains this religious authority not by birth, as was the case, for example, with Hindu and Vedic, uh, Vedic tradition and religion, right? Because in the Vedic and in Hindu tradition, you're born into your position of authority as a Brahmin priest. You're born into the Brahmin class. But in the role, the role of the Acharya within the Jain tradition is something that you earn through your moral conduct, your ascetic practice, and your charisma. And Acharya Chandanaji is certainly, as you can see from the picture here, quite charismatic. And her work shows that she's not only an ascetic, she's not only one giving up and removing herself from the world, but someone who's really attempting to reintegrate this ascetic practice, this ego purifying practice through service to the world. So we can see that across time, the ascetic practice has transformed. Not all ascetics practice that way as Acharya Chandanaji does, Chandanaji does, but they, some do. Some are more proactive and involved than others. And we'll see more of them as we move forward in this lecture series. In the next two lectures, we're going to look at the lay people. How do the lay people interact with the ascetics, but also who are they in and of themselves? As we'll see, they try to live the life of an ascetic, but on a much, much easier scale in the sense that they're householders and they can't afford the time and energy to do all the things the ascetics do. Nevertheless, they do make efforts to do so, and we'll take a look at that in the lectures that follow. Thank you so much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you then.